about 2005, uh, myself, John Wright, Kevin Beaver, and Michael Vaughn uh, kind of realized that we had very much overlapping interests and overlapping uh, hobbies, so to speak, in terms of studying antisocial behavior. Uh, Wright and Beaver are both trained at the University of Cincinnati, which is a, a traditional criminology, criminal justice school. Uh, myself, my PhD is in sociology, uh, but I really never invested in that topic necessarily. Uh, and Mr. Vaughn is, uh, has an interdisciplinary studies PhD uh, with interest in social work and psychiatry and the neurosciences. And what we sort of discovered is that the kind of traditional way to study crime and delinquency was increasingly becoming more uh, uninteresting to us. And we felt that uh, criminology and criminal justice as fields were ignoring uh, in many ways, far superior research and evidence on really the same constructs, okay? And uh, so as you can see, we, we sort of have been interested in um, how can we take a new approach to studying things that are very popular in ACJS and ASC, but bring a different perspective to it to try and, and infuse some new life uh, into these topical areas. Uh, the one that will sort of come up uh, quite a bit is self-control. And what I want to do uh, briefly, just to kind of get you thinking about it, is self-control, uh, as all of you know, is this basic self-regulation thing that Goffertson and Hershey talked about in their 1990 book. Uh, but more broadly, in psychology and psychiatry, self-control is sort of one element of a broader domain or construct called self-regulation. Okay, and particularly within the temperament literature, there's separate components relating to self-regulation or broadly relating to self-control that are nevertheless not the self-control that we think of with, with Goffertson and Hershey and those sort of six uh, traits or characteristics. Uh, and so in I think all four of the papers today, you're going to see elements of these other constructs, whether it's willpower, as, as, as Roy Baumeister would call it, inhibitory control, uh, which is how, how well can you uh, not do something that you want to do, Attentional control, which is how well can you attention or focus or tend to stimuli that you need to attend to uh, while and, and avoid something that's distracting you. Cognitive control, which refers to uh, sort of the higher order um, self-regulation in terms of getting things done. Effortful control is the ability to uh, uh, suppress what you want to do because you know it's not prudent to do it. And then self-control is sort of what Goffertson and Hershey talk about. Uh, impulsivity, temper. Uh, short time horizon, low gratification delay. Okay, so uh, usually what ASC and, and ACJS do is, is do this. And what I want you to do throughout these four papers is to think of it much global, in much more global sense. Okay. Uh, another uh, interest that we had for a variety of reasons was uh, the role that neurology and the role that genetics play as uh, sort of the underpinnings of human behavior and human traits and characteristics. Uh, rather than using predictors of behavioral outcomes, what we were interested in is what are the traits or characteristics that underlie outcomes, okay? What are the neural pathways or neural substrates that underlie those? And then at a most fundamental level, what are the, the genetic underpinnings to those neural substrates? And so what we're doing overall is just adding a ton more specificity to what we've already known. And I'll kind of come back to that point. Um, since we started working together, uh, it's been very fun. But we kind of have a synergistic effect, uh, have published lots of different uh, articles and books in lots of different fields. Uh, so another thing that's kind of unique about the group is uh, I always have enjoyed ACJS. Uh, I, I'm, I, I've disengaged from ASC. Uh, Vaughn's disengaged from ASC. I suspect the other two will soon because we just don't see it as a terribly viable uh, organization for studying crime. And instead, what we are involved in are other organizations. Uh, one is, for example, is an Association for Psychological Science that take that much broader perspective on studying human behavior and using constructs from a bunch of different fields. Okay. 
Uh, the four studies, the first one that's listed on the program is the one that uh, Kevin Beaver uh, was to present. Uh, and this is using a uh, nationally representative data set, the Ad Health, to look at what are some of the uh, social causes. Okay, so here we are, the gene team, but we're talking about what are some of the environmental or social predictors of uh, neuropsychological deficits and, and how does that predict variance in psychopathy. Okay, so this is an article that's coming out uh, in Psychiatric Quarterly, uh, I think, soon. Psychopathy is a personality disorder that's characterized by um, uh, a set or a constellation of traits that are um, rather unpleasant uh, across effective behavioral, lifestyle, and interpersonal uh, domains. Uh, they're basically parasitic, uh, extraordinarily narcissistic, uh, callous and unemotional, guiltless, uh, all of the things you think about when you read true crime books. Um, we know from uh, behavioral genetic research, especially stuff by S.C. Vitting and Robert Kloman, that um, psychopathy is extremely heritable, which means that most of the variance in it is attributable genetic factors. Uh, and their work using twin data in, in England, it's 75% would be on the low end. And when you start looking at callous and unemotional traits that develop in childhood, you're getting irritability estimates of 0.85, 0.9. Uh, to step back for a moment, what irritability is, is one component of behavioral genetics research. And what that tries to do is answer the question, where does this stuff come from? And it partitions variants using twin data into three sources. One is genetic factors, which is called irritability. Two is environmental factors that are shared among siblings or twins, okay, like family effects. Uh, family effects are where criminologists generally think all of the business is happening. And the third component is also environmental area, and that's non-shared or what are unique to the sibling or twin. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> other things that are associated with uh, variants in psychopathy that are, again, environmental are, uh, well, environmental and biosocial are um, Pre uh, prenatal exposure to pathogens, so um, internal cigarette smoking, alcohol, drug use, etc. Uh, abuse, antisocial parenting, uh, all of these factors uh, in conjunction with genetic factors produce variance in psychopathic personality. In the ad health, uh, there's a, uh, they don't have the PCLR, which is sort of the main measure of psychopathy, and so what we use is a, uh, a measure of psychopathic personality that's derived from the five-factor model of personality. And that research by Lyon and White and uh, Josh Miller and, and folks like that. Uh, basically, you take normal personality traits and you find combination that is roughly translated into the psychopathic personality. Uh, the two ones that really jump out are very, very low conscientiousness and very, very low agreeableness, which is really high antagonism. Okay, uh, and then what we were interested in is in uh, neuropsychological deficits, which is this really central explanatory uh, force in Moffitt's life course persistent offender prototype. Okay, and then we have a bunch of parental uh, measures and some other uh, well-known covariates uh, that criminology has shown to be associated with antisocial behavior. And in the ad health, this is just some t-tests for males and females. Uh, interestingly, you see that females have higher psychopathy scores in the ad health uh, using an FFM-derived measure of it. <clears throat> what this table shows is for males, and in these columns, these are, what's, these are psychopathic personality traits regressed on all the covariates. Uh, per measure of neuropsychological deficits, okay? Um, remember, what Moffitt suggests is that all of those uh, things that I, I sort of t started to talk with, these are neuropsychological deficits. If you have a low capacity to do these things, those are deficits. If you have a high capacity to do things, you're, you're going to be socially more successful, okay? And so for Moffitt, uh, when you have low self-regulation, low effortful control, low attentional control, low inhibitory control, um, that makes school very challenging. That makes self-regulation very challenging. 
And when you have social cognitive problems coupled with behavioral problems, school is a long haul for you. Okay, so you can sort of see the interplay between neuropsychiatric deficits and how it unfolds in the behavior. What Moffitt didn't say in her work is that this LCP group are, are the psychopaths. Okay? What we're showing for males is that there is interesting overlap between neuropsychological deficits in Moffitt's work and psychopathic personality. You see the same thing for females. This, I think, shows it more clearly. Uh, this is, with everything else said at its mean, on the x-axis we have neuropsychological deficit scale. Uh, and this would be three standard deviations above the mean, and here would be three standard deviations below the mean on, on neuropsychological deficit. So these would be effectively very pro-social type people who don't have neuropsychological problems. And what you see is they're also not very psychopathic. But incrementally, when you go to the other extreme, uh, persons who are three standard deviations above the mean in terms of neuropsychiatric deficits um, are acutely psychopathic relative to their peers. Okay. So what this is suggesting to us is that this is really Moffitt's developmental taxonomy, uh, specifically those LCP offenders. And what we're showing is that it's very likely that that has incremental predictive validity on psychopathy. Uh, psychopathy is, uh, it's interesting, in, in psychiatry, in psychology, it's studied, it's one of the major areas of emphasis. In criminology and criminal justice, not so much. But in recent years, a number of scholars, uh, not only in our group, but uh, Shane Jones and Donald Lynham, uh, have, have really shown or demonstrated how relevant psychopathy is for understanding antisocial behavior in a criminological sense. Uh, I've done some work where I basically suggested that Goverton and Hershey's low self-control construct is really watered-down psychopathy. Um, the linkages to uh, neuropsychological deficits uh, is consistent with uh, the social cognitive problems that psychopathic youth have. Uh, something else I have up here with reading deficits, one of the core deficits of psychopathy is they're not really good at, although they're manipulative, they can't read emotion well. They don't experience it well. Well, they also can't read well. Okay, so uh, oftentimes we get lost in the uh, violent behavior of psychopathic offenders, but they also have uh, pretty serious neuropsychiatric problems. And moreover, uh, although there are the Ted Bundys of the world, they're not very intelligent. Okay, so the notion that psychopaths are, are, are intelligent or higher uh, is, is empirically not true. Uh, and then finally, there is some interesting synergy between uh, psychopathy more broadly, Moffitt's work, Lynham's fledgling psychopathy work, and, and we think criminal careers research. Uh, and, and sort of one of the things that's guided my career is to what degree are criminal career researchers, psychopathy researchers, and neuropsychiatric deficits Moffitt scholars, what, to what degree are they really converging or talking about the same people? particularly when you see it's 5 to 10% who are pathological, uh, that seems to suggest that there's a lot of empirical overlap between those constructs. Okay, this one's conceptual. And uh, this is um, Patrick Lussier and uh, Raymond Corrado did, edited a special issue. Uh, of, it's a Canadian journal and uh, this paper uh, was published there last year. And really what we wanted to do with this was to um, really do a targeted uh, literature review of neuropsychological deficits relating to self-control, which we've already kind of talked about. And more broadly, the thing that's very interesting to me is temperament. How are these two things or constructs important for understanding um, not only how they're related to antisocial behavior, but also how they could be targets for preventing serious antisocial behavior. And everyone, whether they're super left or super right, likes prevention. If you're super left, you like prevention because it's humanistic. If you're super right, you like prevention because it saves a ton of money. And so prevention's a rare thing in the social sciences in that people across the political spectrum like it and uh, it kind of made famous by David Olds' work. But if you look at, can we prevent 
uh, this sort of acutely antisocial stuff uh, from developing, the literature isn't as clear there. And this uh, quotation from Richard Tremblay sort of gets at this, uh, where he sort of boldly says, you know, whatever value or prevention there is, and there is value, uh, it's much less impressive when you're looking at those severe uh, types of offenders. Uh, is prevention working for trying to develop uh, the development of, of uh, aggression? And moreover, then does that have any sort of lasting power? The first of uh, the two uh, targets, the first one is neuropsychological deficits relating to self-control. And again, to kind of go back, this was, uh, I think, sort of language that Moffat has used. And I want to jump back to this schematic again. So you see these constructs showing up again and again, effortful control, cognitive control, attentional control, inhibitory control. And here you see it here. Um, think about two archetypal children, that person who is very uh, highly achieving and a person who has um, uh, severe behavioral problems. Okay, so get those two kids in your mind. And then evaluate those two kids based upon how well they can do these things. Or more importantly, have their teacher evaluate those two kids on how well they can concentrate. Uh, how can the child sit in the chair or does the child climb the chair? Uh, does the child focus on the, the overhead projector or is the child focusing on every single extraneous stimuli you can imagine? Okay. When you get to all of this and you step back, these are neuropsychological deficits that are related to self-control. If you are high on these overall, you, you basically have the recipe for social functioning. When you have impairments in these, the first area that really gets harmed is your school performance. And it also affects your peer relationships, it affects your family relationships. And when you start having that dysfunction across domains, you start having clinical disorders. <clears throat> For, in criminology, what's really important for us is understanding um, what are some of the lower order executive functions that relate to the things that really are the immediate precursors of crime. A lot of crime in the United States and worldwide is caused by um, people who have an intense interaction or a dispute, and one person gets offended, and that person can inhibit what they want to do to that other person. And so what do they do? temper and they act out. Uh, temper, which we all kind of know from Goblin's and Hershey, is a profound predictor of antisocial behavior because it's really representing the, the marriage of aggression, the marriage of uh, not delaying gratification. You can't get over that affront or that uh, confrontation. You can't just let it go. Okay. And so all of this stuff is really right prior to a crime occurring is what's going on neurocognitively. Um, in the developmental psychopathology literature, these are referred to as hot executive functions because they're sort of the things that get uh, people really revved up and immediately precipitate some kind of crime, okay, especially an assault. Uh, children who have uh, a lot of letters up there. Uh, oppositional defiant disorder is a prodrome of conduct disorder, which is a prodrome of antisocial personality disorder. Uh, and ADHD, uh, there's really three types. There's an inattentive type, there's an impulsive hyperactive type, and then there's the one that's most pernicious, which is the combined type. Children who have these uh, disorders, particularly when they have them comorbidly, display all of those neuropsychiatric problems relating to self-control. And children who comorbid for these conditions are what Donald Lyman called fledgling psychopaths. So I didn't even plan it, but again, in my own language, Lyman's work and neuropsychiatry and neuro neuropsychology is sort of jumping and linking to psychopathy. Uh, our group has found evidence of a, of a sort of pathological subgroup in a national uh, longitudinal study of uh, kindergarten children. And you can just see them quite clearly. Uh, most kindergartners are just fine and dandy. And then you have a 10% group uh, that would be perhaps consistent with an LCP group or a chronic offending group um, who has severe impairments in self-regulation. 
Um, the good news is, and we're going to get on this one if you're wondering about the prevention, is that across school there are uh, very impressive interventions targeting these areas. So if you think about Tremblay's kind of skeptical quote to start this paper, uh, Tools of the Mind basically is an instruction uh, to preschoolers to get them to sort of have a self-talk. Think about what you're doing. Um, PATHS is a curriculum in elementary school years that, again, is trying to get kids to, uh, rather than climbing on the chair, think about what is it that, about me climbing on the chair that gets my teacher upset? And why is it better for me and everyone else if I just sit in the chair like all the other kids? Okay, so there are pretty promising programs that are targeting some of these temperamental and neuropsychiatric uh, deficits, and I'll come back to that as well. Temperament is something that is sort of the domain of developmental psychology, uh, especially people like Jerome Kagan and Mary Rothbart, uh, Thomas and Chess. But basically, uh, you're going to get a million definitions of it, but temperament is the irritable way. Okay, so again, we're seeing irritability come up. That a person self-regulates and responds or reacts to the environment. Okay, uh, the, the metaphor that's often used is some people are canoes. Uh, they go quietly through the water, uh, you don't hear them, they're calm, they're nice, they make very little ripple in the water. And then you have paddle boats that are choppy, loud, noisy, uh, they make waves and they're annoying. If you think of a canoe and a paddle boat as representing sort of two ends of the spectrum in terms of temperament and how a person or a boat regulates and how it sort of interacts with the environment. Um, Criminologically speaking, uh, there, there's um, strong evidence uh, for sort of subgroups uh, based on temperament, and really some of the big ones that we want to focus on are difficultness, uh, which is really primarily related to high negative emotionality, and also under control, which is really low self-control, low self-regulation, uh, low effortful control. When you have a child who has high negative affect coupled with low self-regulation, you're going to have sort of a problematic temperament. And their uh, Dunedin birth cohort stuff, uh, Caspi, Moffitt, Silva, and colleagues have, have tracked uh, temperament measures at age three and have found, excuse me, that they have predictive validity decades into adulthood. Uh, more, more profoundly, uh, the kids who have under control temperament at age three uh, have a two to five fold higher likelihood of uh, antisocial personality disorder. Uh, arrest, violence, criminal justice system involvement, and all of the social failures that accompany crime. Uh, high, uh, high unemployment, uh, relationship discord, etc. <clears throat> Prevention programs that usually focus on family functioning um, have shown some nice success at dealing with some of these uh, negative aspects of temperament of children primarily by trying to modify those traits and reducing the amount of coercive exchanges, as Gerald Patterson would call them, that are occurring. Okay, so uh, maybe the teacher, instead of causing an incident, because uh, Johnny is sort of sitting, um, just kind of quietly comes over and puts her hand on his shoulder. Uh, it's not a policy, but it's something that could probably get him to attend rather than asking him what he's doing. Um, I'm going to jump down here. Is anyone familiar with Rosina Kachanska's work who looks at how the conscience develops? And so it's sort of, uh, it's, it's its own kind of child development literature, but it's related to callous and emotional traits and it's related to psychopathy. And uh, it's fascinating research. And basically, uh, what her stuff does is talks about neuroticism, which is a core uh, temperamental construct. Um, people who have high levels of neuroticism are what? They're neurotic. They're <laughs> 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 <So> neurotic. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, it's that, it's that simple. Okay. They're neurotic, so they experience high levels of anxiety, uh, high levels of mostly anxiety. Uh, people who are very low neurotics uh, are kind of cool and calm. Okay. Um, when you're developing a, a conscience of a child, uh, if you have a child with normal